Welcome back, everybody, and it's time for some more Mass Effect. And today, uh, we're back on the Normandy. We're going to basically just talk to everybody and get the feel of the ship, uh, mostly so that, you know, everybody can figure out what's going on with who. If you want, so the part of this that we're going to be doing um, is an hour long, but afterwards we're going to go through the codex. So if you're that type of person that you'd like to see some of that stuff, maybe you've never actually done it um, or actually read the codex, it will be the last hour. So this video is two hours long, but the first hour is what you and I will sit here through. And then the last hour, of course, is the codex itself. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started on the next part of Mass Effect. That is your chance to be rude. Hey kid, don't ever let them get inside your head. They'll tell you what to do in life instead. Of everything you know that you could get. Don't let them guide your life towards regret. I'll fight for what I love with every breath. My past is filled with things I won't forget. Use them all to push me to my best So treat the worst of times just like a test If only I could go back in time I'd tell myself that everything will end up alright Just push yourself, test yourself, figure out what you like and Find your limits, don't be rigid, always work towards a prime Surround yourself with open minds, people can change your life A few friends with intent can help you feel alive Find a passion, take some action, and with a little time Just be patient, make a statement, try to enjoy your life They'll try to kick you while you're down they wanna rise up while you drown They wanna fill your head with doubt They're silently scared that you'll figure it out I'll make it look like I'm losing Won't bother hiding my bruises And when they finally think you're wounded Then it's your chance to be ruthless I can see that they compare I think everyone's against me Maybe something in the air Am I paranoid? I swear a void is forming And they're scared I walk a straight path Not many can say that I like to play fast Cross me and there's payback You better pray that I don't see your face at Any place that I go I know you hate that I've been doing fine I'm not wasting any more time I live for the fight and the climb and I think that the pain that's deep inside Is what defines So I won't give up, I'm gonna make it to the top I don't care what's in my way, I swear I'm never gonna stop I could fall flat on my face and I swear I will get back up Cause I don't deserve a thing and the road ahead is tough They'll try to kick you while you're down They wanna rise up while you drown they want to fill your head with doubt They're silently scared that you'll figure it out Woken up from our situation We have met with the beacon We have gotten zapped into oblivion Now let's go talk to people We've, we've become a specter All that fun stuff
I am eventually going to talk to Presley, just not right this second. Presley's kind of an asshole. But to the man that makes the Normandy dance, let's go talk to Joker. Commander, something you need? So, oh. All right, tell me about the the, the, the ship. <laughs> Can't work today. How's the Normandy performing? Is she everything they said she'd be? She's the best ship in the fleet. If you've got a pilot who knows how to handle her, balance isn't what you'd expect. Takes a while to get used to that oversized drive core we got stuffed in the back, and her power can sneak up on you if you're not careful. The Normandy's probably too much ship for your average Alliance pilot, Commander. Lucky for you, I'm anything but average. You're also anything but normal, but here we are. So <laughs> let's just talk. I like to know my crew. Mind if I ask you a few questions? <laughs> I can see where this is going. You did a background check on me, didn't you? <laughs> well, I'll tell you the same thing I told the captain. You want me as your pilot. I'm not good. I'm not even great. I am the best damn helmsman in the Alliance fleet. Top of my class in flight school, I earned that. All those commendations in my file, I earned every single one. Those weren't given to me as charity for my disease. I'm sorry, my bad. I'm sorry, Joker. I didn't even know you were sick. You mean, you mean you didn't know? No. Oh crap. I'm sorry. Okay, I've got Vrolic syndrome, brittle bone disease. The bones in my legs never develop properly. They're basically hollow, too much force and they'll shatter. Even with crutches and my leg braces, it's hard to get around. One wrong step and crack! It's very dramatic. But I've learned to manage my condition, Commander. <laughs> Put the Normandy in my hands and I'll make her dance for you. Just don't ask me to get up and dance unless, you know, you like the sound of snapping shin bones. <laughs> I mean, that's fair. <laughs> Tell me more about that. Let's see. I need to know more about this Brolix syndrome if I'm putting my ship in your hands. Yeah, of course you do. It's an extremely rare condition. Nobody knows exactly what causes it. Genetic, maybe. It's treatable, but there's no cure. To classify my case as moderate to severe. I was born with over a dozen fractures. Hip, thighs, ankles, my bones were already breaking in the womb. A hundred years ago, I wouldn't have survived past my first year. Lucky for me, modern medical science has turned me into a productive member of society. <laughs> Productive. I love that. All right, how do you do your job? You're not going to break a bone trying to fly the ship, are you? Uh, I don't fly with my feet, Commander, so I'm fine as long as I'm in this chair. I got to be real careful when I get up to take a piss, though. I can do my job as well as anyone on the ship. Better, actually. So don't worry about it. I got you. All right, let's try something else. I'm not trying to make you uncomfortable. Let's talk about something else. Whatever you want, Commander. Why are you named Joker? Why does everyone call you Joker? It's a lot shorter than saying Alliance Flight Lieutenant Jeff Moreau. Plus, I love to make little children laugh. <laughs> oh, sweet Jesus. I was just thinking how much you remind me of Santa Claus. Look, I didn't pick the name. One of the instructors in flight school used to bug me about never smiling. She started calling me Joker, and it stuck. Okay, why were you not smiling? Other than Why didn't you ever smile? Hey, I worked my ass off in flight school, Commander. The world's not gonna hand you anything if you go around grinning like an idiot. By the end of the year, I was the best pilot in the academy. Even better than the instructors, and everybody knew it. They'd all got their asses kicked by the sickly kid with the creaky little legs. One guess who was smiling at graduation. Gotcha. All right. I have to go. All right, see ya. All right, see ya. One marker for the codex.
This one's fun. Does anybody guess who am I going to talk to? Computer, give me a real time connection to the dreadnought Kilimanjaro. I want to speak to my mother, Exo Shepard. Mommy! Shepard speak. Oh, hi. I don't have time for a personal call right now. I'm on duty. I get it. I'm sorry. I know what that's like. Do you remember Lieutenant Zabaleta from the Einstein? Ernesto? Have you heard from him? He was one of the Marines who guarded the CIC. We shared a watch. I lost track of him after there was an incident. He's on the Citadel. I've seen him here on the Citadel. Looks like he's had some hard times. I don't doubt it. You remember the Batarian raid on Mindwar in 2170? You were in high school. The Einstein's task group responded to the May Day. The Batarians were still pulling out when the Marines hit groundside. Zabaleta was one of the first down. He... he was never quite the same after. Okay. I don't understand. What happened down there? About every abomination that a sentient being can do to another. To a slaver, a person is just another animal. And humans aren't always liked out here. We heard about corralling. Uh, culling. They'd shoot those they couldn't use, implant control devices in the skulls of those they could, without anesthetic. Oh. <laughs> yeah. He has post-traumatic stress because of what he saw? He tried to keep working, but it rode him. He showed up drunk on duty more and more. We couldn't always cover for him. The Alliance discharged him. Everyone knew he drank because of what he'd seen down there, even if he never talked about it. Especially because he never talked about it. Yeah, I can imagine that. That was that sounds have bad. affected him that deeply. He must have been a very sensitive man. He was always in laughter and tears. If you see him, tell him we still worry about him. Tell him to go to the Veterans Affairs office. I have to go, but take care of yourself. You're making us proud. Kilimanjaro out. Thanks, Mom! So basically, the guy lost his shit because um, people were basically being brutalized on that planet. Okay, let's talk to Presley. If anyone has to take over for Captain Anderson, I'm glad it's you. Thanks. I'm not sure about having non-humans on our ship, though. Hey, no xenophobes. We're all on the same team here, Presley. With all due respect, ma'am, that's what they said about Nihilus. Look how that turned out. And you doubt me? I'm in charge here, Presley. I decide if we have non-humans on this vessel. Yes, ma'am. Understood, ma'am. Good. Now, don't be a dick about it. Okay. Carry on, Presley. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, he's gonna throw a pissing match and a little hissy fit about it, but... I mean, Ashley's kind of the same way, so... Huge xenophobes, but uh, Ashley's backstory has a little to do with that. Presley's just an asshole. But I don't... I guess that's, you know, kind of par for the course. You, it doesn't matter where you go, there's... Somebody's going to be a xenophobe of some caliber. Oops. D 
stuck in the chocolates. I can love her. Yes, Commander? Is there something you need? Let's chat. <laughs> Talk to me about Caden. How well do you know the Lieutenant? I'd never worked with him before this mission. But he has an impressive service record. Over a dozen special commendations. Tends to keep to himself, though. Maybe because of the headaches. It's not easy being an L2. An L2? What does that have to do with it? Well, most biotics now use the L3 implants. Lieutenant Alenko was wired with the old L2 configuration. Sometimes there are complications. What complications? What kind of complications? Severe mental disabilities, insanity, crippling physical pain. There's a long list of horrific side effects. Caden's lucky. He just gets migraines. I mean, that would be nice to not have to deal with all that bullshit, so... I should go. Goodbye, Commander. Do not take if you are allergic to L2 or any of its components. Anything you need, Commander? Okay. Talk to me, bud. Just trying to get a sense of where the crew's at. Thoughts? I've wasted enough of your time for now, Commander. We'll have time for personal debriefings later. All right, well, tell me about tactics. What's your opinion on the last mission? I don't see how we could have done things any better. At least not without getting to Eden Prime sooner. And we were on the scene faster than any other Alliance ship could have been. That's true. Okay, we'll talk to him later. We'll talk another time, Lieutenant. Commander? Still probably one of the slowest elevators in all of gaming history. And granted, we modded the shit out of it, so there is that. And next up for the best side bro since Chewbacca. Garrus. Thanks for bringing me on board, Commander. You're welcome. I knew working with this vector would be better than life at CSEC. You knew that, huh? Have you worked with the Spectre before? Well, no, but I know what they're like. Spectres make their own rules. You're free to handle things your way. On CSEC, you're buried by rules. The damn bureaucrats are always on your back. Yeah, it's not that bad. For the most part, the rules are there for a reason. Maybe. But sometimes it feels like the rules are only there to stop me from doing my work. If I'm trying to take down a suspect, it shouldn't matter how I do it, as long as I do it. But CSEC wants it done their way. Protocol and procedure come first. That's why I left. That's it. That's why you left. Because of rules. So you just quit because you didn't like the way they do things? There's more to it than that. It didn't start out bad, but as I rose in ranks, I got saddled with more and more red tape. C-Sex handling of Saren was typical. I just couldn't take it anymore. I hate leaving. Yeah, tough call. I hope you made the right choice. I'd hate for you to regret it later. Well, that's sort of why I teamed up with you. It's a chance for me to get off the Citadel, see how things are done outside c -Sec. Either way, I plan to make the most of this. And without c -Sec headquarters looking over my shoulder, 
maybe I can get the job done my way for a change. Sure. <laughs> if getting the job done means endangering innocent people, then no. We get the job done right, not fast. Got it? I wasn't trying to. I understand, Commander. Okay. Go talk to Ashley, make sure she's okay. Ashley has issues. Commander. Okay. What's up? What's your opinion of the last mission? Kinda wish you'd got there sooner, Commander. No offense, I appreciate the rescue. I just wish... You wish we could have saved your guys, I get it. You wish we'd been able to save the rest of your unit. Yes, ma'am. If I had been more alert, we wouldn't have been cut down by an ambush. You can't be the hero all the time, dear. The Geth are perfect ambushers. They don't move, they don't make noise, they don't even breathe. They have flashlight heads, ma'am. I'll make sure it doesn't happen again. <laughs> all right, let's talk. Do you have a few minutes to talk, one-on-one? -on -one? I'm sorry, Commander. I need to get my duty squared away. I wouldn't mind talking more later, though. Alright, fine. I should go. Dismissed, Chief. Ma'am. Okay, let's go ahead and do this. Now, part of the mods that we've put into Mass Effect is, well, as I was saying in the last video, is about the weapons. And depending on who the person is that is being equipped, will depict uh, what we give them. So, like, for our 100% biotics, like Liara and stuff like that, she does not need a sniper rifle. That is the dumbest shit to give her. It just really is. So... But, you know, Garrus, who is basically a mirror reflection of Shepard, he kind of needs stuff that works for him. You have Rex, who's a tank, and while he, while we're going to equip everybody with the sidearm, he's not the type of person who needs a pistol, because if you get in his personal space, he's going to tank your ass, and that's just the way it is. Oh, let's see what we got here. Tally, who is very tech savvy. Probably, you know, yes, I'm giving her a shotgun, but it's mostly for aesthetics. Everybody's getting a rifle just because in the cutscenes they need that's what they show as a rifle. So. But more often than not, Tally is going to be using a pistol. have somebody like Caden who is human biotic <laughs> uh. 
and then Ashley, who is all about the melee. What's up, big guy? Nice ship you got, Shepard. Thanks. What can I do for you? Let's chit-chat. Rex. What's your story, Rex? There's no story. Go ask the Quarian if you want stories. <laughs> Come on, talk to me. You Krogans live for centuries. Don't tell me you haven't had a few interesting adventures. Well, there was this one time the Turians almost wiped out our entire race. That was fun. No. <laughs> I love Rex. <laughs> I heard about that. You know, they almost did the same to us. It's not the same. Oh, and how is that? It seems pretty much the same to me. So your people were infected with a genetic mutation? An infection that makes only a few in a thousand children survive birth? And I suppose it's destroying your entire species? Okay, yeah, no, that's different. That's definitely different. I suppose it isn't all the same. I don't expect you to understand, but don't compare humanity's fate with the Krogan. Okay. My bad. I was just making conversation. I wasn't trying to upset you. Your ignorance doesn't upset me, Shepard. As for the Krogan, I gave up on them long ago. The genophage infected us, but it's not what's killing us. Okay. Let's talk about that genophage. What can you tell me about the genophage? Ask the Salarians if you want details. They made it. All I know, it makes breeding nearly impossible. Thousands die in stillbirth, and most never get that far. Every Krogan is infected, every one. And no one's rushing to find a cure. Why? Why don't the Krogan try to find a cure? When was the last time you saw a Krogan scientist? You ask a Krogan, would he rather find a cure for the genophage or fight for credits? He'll choose fighting every time. It's just who we are, Shepard. I can't change that. Nobody can. Okay, let's talk about this extinction thing. Are your people really dying? We're sure not getting any stronger. We're too spread out. None of us are interested in staying in our own system. So... Lots of species have left their homes and prospered. But they go to colonize new worlds. We're not settlers. We're warriors. We want to fight. So we leave. Hire ourselves out. And most of us never go back. Okay, I gotcha. So long, Rex. Shepard. Shepard. <laughs> That'll be later. Talk to the engineer, and then we'll talk to Tally. Hey, Commander, you know that Quarian Tally? She's been spending all her time down here asking me about our engines. Is that bothering you? I'll tell her to leave you alone. What? No, she's amazing. I wish my guys were half as smart as she is. Give her a month on board, and she'll know more about our engines than I do. She's got a real knack for technology, that one. I can see why you wanted her to come along. 
She is very useful, yes. I figured she'd be a real asset to the team. You've got an eye for talent, Commander. But I'm guessing that's not why you came down here. Carry on, Adams. Aye, aye, Commander. So a lot of these preliminary talks that we talk with people uh, gives us a lot of information on how to utilize them later. Your ship's amazing, Shepard. I've never seen a drive core like this before. I can't believe you were able to fit it into a ship this small. I'm starting to understand why you humans have been so successful. I had no idea Alliance vessels were so advanced. If this ship is special. <laughs> it's the Normandy. The Normandy's a prototype, cutting-edge technology. A month ago, I was patching a makeshift fuel line into a converted tug ship in the flotilla. Now, I'm sitting on board one of the most advanced vessels in Citadel space. I have to thank you again for bringing me along. You're welcome. Traveling on a vessel like this is a dream come true for me. So this is your thing, huh? Got it. I like it. I had no idea you found ship technology so interesting. It comes with being a Quarian. The migrant fleet is the key to the survival of my people. Ships are our most valuable resource. But we don't have anything like this. We make do with cast-offs and second-hand equipment. We just try to keep them running for as long as we can. Some of the fleet's larger vessels date all the way back to our original flight from the Geth. Yeah, that was a minute ago. Slip it. I can't believe your fleet's still using ships that are three centuries old. They're constantly being repaired, modified, and refitted. They aren't pretty, but they work. Mostly. We've tried to make ourselves as independent as possible on the flotilla. Grow our own food, mine, and process our own fuel. But some things we just can't make on our own. A patch to maintain the hull integrity requires raw materials we just don't have. That's why our pilgrimages are so important. Okay. Let's talk a little bit more about all this. Tell me about your people. Our lives aren't easy. Resources are scarce, and we are constantly on the move. Everything we do must in some way contribute to the continuation of the migrant fleet. There are 17 million Quarians in the flotilla, and each of us relies on the others for survival. The bonds among my people are strong. Unfortunately, we have had to surrender many of the freedoms and civil liberties other species take for granted. That is not much. What kind of freedoms? Well, it's illegal for parents to have more than one child. If our population grows too much, it would strain our resources to their breaking point. Of course, we also can't allow our numbers to become too few. If our population is in decline, the rule against single births is temporarily repealed. In extreme cases of population decline, incentives are even offered to encourage multiple births. Though the Conclave hasn't had to take such measures in nearly a century. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about the Conclave. Then I want to talk about this whole 17 government. million thing. The Conclave is our civilian branch of government. Each ship can elect a representative to serve on the Conclave and make decisions that affect the fleet as a whole. On matters that affect an individual ship, however, the captain has the final say. It's a tradition that dates back to the early days, when the fleet was governed by martial law. Fortunately, most captains nowadays are smart enough to have an elected council from their crew to give them advice and guidance. So you're democratic. So the ultimate power rests with elected officials? In practice, the Conclave and the respective council for each ship tend to set the rules that govern our daily lives. But in theory, we are still under military jurisdiction. The five top-ranking military officials in the fleet serve on the Admiralty Board. These five have the power to overrule any decision by the Conclave in case of emergency. To do so requires unanimous agreement among the Admiralty. And they can only do this once. After that, the entire board must resign their posts. It's a safeguard that served us well. 
In nearly three centuries, the Admiralty Board has only overruled the Conclave four times. Okay. Let's talk about uh, the pilgrimages. I want to know more about the pilgrimage. When my people reach maturity, we leave our birth ships and seek acceptance with a new crew. It's necessary to maintain genetic diversity among the fleet. But no ship wants to accept someone who will be a burden on them. So, to prove our worth, we embark on a pilgrimage. We set out alone, leaving the flotilla and our families behind us. We only return once we have found something of value we can bring back to the fleet. This is presented as a gift to the captain of the respective ship we wish to join. If the gift is accepted, we are welcomed into the crew. And do they always accept your basic dowry? Can a captain choose to reject the gift? And that doesn't happen often. Most captains are eager to increase the size of their crew. It increases their own standing in our society. Even when a gift is not particularly valuable, the captain usually accepts it out of a sense of tradition. However, there is a stigma to presenting a substandard gift. It's not the best way to make a good impression on a new community. Most pilgrims don't return until they find something worthwhile. Yeah, that's dangerous. A little bit. I can't believe they just send you off alone. It's not like they just cast us out. Before we leave, we are given lessons in how to survive outside the flotilla, and given gifts to help us on our journey. We also receive implants to fight off sickness and disease. Generations of living in an isolated and highly controlled environment have left our immune systems weaker than most. By the time we leave the fleet, we are well equipped for the pilgrimage. This is a rite of passage for all Quarians. If it were dangerous, our numbers would suffer. Virtually every pilgrimage ends with a triumphant return and the ritual presentation of the gift to one of the fleet's captains. Got it. I want to talk about something else. Like what? Talk about the geth. I want to know more about the geth. I doubt I can tell you anything you don't already know. It's been almost three centuries since they drove my people into exile. All I know is the story of their origins. What they were when we created them, and how they turned on us. Well, tell us. Interesting. The Geth were originally created to serve as an automated manual labor force. Initially, their intelligence was as limited as any VI. Over time, we made small modifications to their programming to allow them to perform more varied and complex tasks, bringing them closer and closer to true AI status. So, this is illegal? Right? How come the Council didn't step in and stop you? This wasn't true AI research. We may have been skirting the bounds of the law, but we never did anything that was actually illegal. The changes were so insignificant, so gradual, that we were able to control them. Or so we thought. But one thing we underestimated was the power of the neural network. A million Geth thinking simultaneously created an inherently unstable matrix. Neural network. Unimind. <laughs> so the Geth share brain power? Many of the Geth's logic systems were designed to work in concert with other nearby Geth. Basically, the more of them you have in a group, the smarter they are. So, Unimind, like the Borg. So, there's some sort of group consciousness? No, nothing like that. They cannot share sensory data or information. Their programming cannot handle that much simultaneous input. Each Geth maintains an individual awareness and identity. The neural network only operates on a process-based level. It's basically the synthetic equivalent of a subconscious. But when they're in close proximity, they can coordinate low-level functional processes, freeing up more capacity for original or independent thought. Huh? <laughs> There's a lot that doesn't make on. any sense. I'm probably oversimplifying. 
The Geth are incredibly advanced and complex creations. All you need to know is that they get smarter when they gather in large numbers. As we built more and more Geth, their effective intelligence became more sophisticated, more abstract. One day, a Geth began to ask its Quarian overseer questions about the nature of its existence. Am I alive? Why am I here? What is my purpose? As you can imagine, this caused a near panic among my people. I mean, I get it, but why? I don't see what's so bad about those questions. The Geth were created to engage in mundane, repetitive, or dangerous manual labor. That's fine for machines, but it won't satisfy a sentient being for long. The Geth were showing signs of rudimentary self-awareness and independent thought. If the Geth were intelligent, then we were essentially using them as slaves. It was inevitable the newly sentient Geth would rebel against their situation. We knew they would rise up against us, so we acted first. A general order went out across all Quarian-controlled systems to permanently deactivate all Geth. The Geth responded to this order violently. So they defended themselves. Hey, you can't blame them for fighting for their survival. We had no other choice. The Geth were already on the verge of revolution. By acting quickly, we had a chance to end the war before it began. The hope was that most of the Geth would still be little more than machines, incapable of organized resistance. But they had progressed much further than anyone anticipated. The war was long and bloody. Millions upon millions of Quarians died at their hands. In the end, we were forced to flee our own homeworld. We feared the Geth would pursue us, but they never came beyond the Veil. Now, we drift through space, exiled, searching for a way to reclaim what was once ours. Okay, but they did still defend themselves. It's hard to feel sorry for you. Your ancestors tried to wipe out another species. We made a mistake when we created the Geth in the first place, but we did not make a mistake when we went to war against them. If we had not acted, they would have wiped us out. They're a synthetic life form. They have no use for organics. None. Why do you think they cut themselves off from the rest of the galaxy? Why do you think they've killed every organic being who's ever tried to contact them? <laughs> I mean, not all of them have, but I mean, I get it. They didn't kill Saren. What does that tell you? The Geth are not innocent victims in all this. They're the enemy. They want to destroy us. Not just the Quarians. All organic life. That's why they've joined up with Saren. And that's why we have to stop him. She, she is a little touchy about this, and I get it. I understand why. I should go. See you later. Okay, I'm going to go back to this whole 17 million quarry. And in the United States in 2022, there were 333.3 million people. And there are only 17 million quarry. And that is 5.3. 1% of the United States population of 2022. Think about that. Really think about that. That is not a lot of Quarians. So yeah, they were just about taken down to extinction. See what we got going on here. Hey, Commander. Up? Looking for some extra supplies before you head out? Let's talk about that. What have you got? Whatever you want. 
Armor, weapons, mods? It's not standard Alliance issue, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Chocolate well, covered Well, as strawberries. long as you don't mind paying for it. So I have to pay you to... yeah. Why should I pay you for my weapons and armor? My stuff doesn't come from the Alliance. I have to purchase it myself, and it's not cheap. Hell, the licenses alone have set me back more than I'd like. But no licenses, no goods. Without the goods, I'm out of a job. Huh. Let's talk about the licensing. What are licenses? Why do you need them? Manufacturers sell licenses. Each license allows me to buy and sell a certain brand of products. I already have several basic ones, but you'll need to buy more if you want me to bring in different brands. Many of the best licenses are hard to get, but they're well worth the cost if you can find them. Okay. What manufacturers? What do the different manufacturers offer? There are too many for me to keep track of, but each license will explain what it's good for. That's fair. How often will you get new items? Well, that depends on how many licenses you've purchased. But I'll rotate items on a regular basis regardless. And any time we land someplace with a big enough port, I'll buy, sell, and trade whatever I can. Check back often. I need to move items quickly, so only the most basic items will be stocked consistently. Okay, I like it. So show me what you got. Let's see what you got. You bet, Commander. Ouch. Ignore how many credits I have. <laughs> this has been built up for a long time. Many, many hours of playing. Who else do I need to talk to? I talk to Ashley, Caden, Presley, Joker, Garrus, Rex, Chakwas, um, Tally, the RO. Liara yet, so I can't talk to her. Caden's busy doing something over there. I don't even know. Called mom. up some more stuff into the codex for you guys.
Okay, from Captain Anderson, I'm sure you're already finding your marks as the new commander of the Normandy. Take care of her for me, will you? I forgot to tell you that I had a private terminal in the Normandy configured to respond to your credentials, although if you're reading this, I imagine you figured it out. Anyway, hope you won't receive too much bad news. Good luck. Perfect. Okay, from Admiral Hackett. Congrats on becoming the first human specter. It's a big honor. I know you'll do humanity proud. As a specter, you and by extension the Normandy and her crew answer only to the council that leaves your post as lieutenant commander in the Alliance in some kind of limbo that our beacon. Okay, can't pronounce that. Are still trying to wrap their heads around. I know what it is, but I can't remember how to pronounce it. Shepard, I'll be clear. We didn't invest all those credits into the Normandy for no reason. You, we had several special operations in mind for that ship. And although we can no longer command you to carry out our orders, we still need those missions seen to. Be in touch with details of those special ops as and when. And I know you that your pursuit of Saren is your top priority. Perfect. We'll have some other missions. Good. Engineer Marcus Greco. Just want to let you know that the prayers of the M35 Mako IFV. <laughs> We've turned up the 15, our 155 millimeter mass accelerated cannon. <laughs> And overhauled the onboard VI. Should be capable of limited self repair in the field now, as long as you have the Omni Gel to spare. I'd recommend having someone on board with specialization in electronics. Also, we've taken the liberty of installing boosters. Nice. <coughs> Excuse me. Awesome. See, this is all really good information for us to have, so we know exactly what we need when we're doing stuff. Alright, from the Corian fleet. News vids have reached us here on the flotilla of your induction into the Spectres. First, I must congratulate you. It has become apparent to us here at the flotilla that you have enlisted the help of one of the children of the migrant fleet, so I must warn you. Tally Zora is an impressionable young woman on her pilgrimage, not a soldier. We implore you to consider Tally Zora's safety as a matter of highest priority. If something unspeakable were to happen to her, the Admiral Admiralty of the Migrant Fleet would no doubt be inconsolable and may hold you and all those who stood by personally responsible. May you stand... Oh, oh good, we're being threatened by the Admiral. Perfect. <laughs> Don't let my baby girl get hurt. I love it. Okay, let's see. Dossier forwarded from special ta- oh, from- Okay, from Spectres. Saren. All the information on Saren. Operatives sent to monitor Saren have gone dark, including Matriarch Venezia, who has been seen recently to act on Saren's behalf. In addition, Saren commands an unidentified dreadnought of indeterminate origin, as well as having some measure of influence over the Geth. Saren's charisma, firepower, and influence should under no circumstance be underestimated. So that's fun because um, it's saying all operatives, and that means that Matriarch Venezia was an operative of the Spectres. That's fun. That she's hot. I'm not even gonna lie. That's all I can say about that. But that I know who does her voice, so it just makes it even better. Transcript of audio file. Mom, please shut down the fusion. I'm going to die. God, I hope you're hearing this. I think it's hates humans going to wipe us out. Please hurry from an asteroid in the Exodus Cluster. I see we've got a new Spectre, human to boot, wonderful. I'm in command of the state of our combat simulator design for special ops. If you be so kind to grace us with your presence, we here at the Pinnacle Station would love to see how humanity's first Spectre handles a firefight or two. We're overdue for a laugh. Oh, asshole. Find us in the Phoenix system, Argos Row. Make sure you've downloaded the most up-to-date star chart of the region. We don't appear on older versions. No doubt some FNG file the damn thing wrong. Looking forward to seeing you in action, Commander Admiral Ahern. Okay. 
Okay. News bulletin. Shining a light on organized crime in the Citadel wards from Emily Wong. Although there has been word on the street for many years that the infamous Cora's Den on Zakira Ward is a hangout for local crime lords and drug dealers, FCC can today report on this with certainty. Having recently acquired data straight from the files of Cora's Den, most previous proprietor, the human male known as Fist, this station can now shed some light on the topic, according to the data, which has very extensive. Fist had dealings not only with organized crime lords who use this bar regularly to arrange deals and move product, but also with the equally notorious information trader known as the Shadow Broker. His files also make reference to discussions with the elusive terminus group known as the Collectors, although it is not known whether any deals were made. But most interestingly, nestled in amongst this treasure trove of information is reference to the Spectre Saren Arterius, more specifically dealings with him. In a complex web of deceit and betrayal, Fist appears to have betrayed his crime lord patrons as and when it suited him, first to the Shadow Broker and next to the Council Spectre. In particular, Arterius was most recently interested in recovering incriminating data that may have damaging implications. Stay tuned. Okay. Alright, that was the last of those messages. Yay! So this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna take a look around here. Shepard is going to take a nap as she reads through the codex. I'm Angel. This is Gaming with Angels. Thanks for watching, everybody. Tune in tomorrow for Baldur's Gate and then Thursday for NATO Plays on Thursdays with L.A. Noir. But stick around because we are going to go through the uh, codex. I'm just going to mute the microphone and let you guys read at your own speed. Thanks for watching, everybody, and I'll see everyone next week. The Asari were the first species to discover the citadel. When the Salarians arrived, it was the Asari who proposed the establishment of the Citadel Council to maintain peace throughout the galaxy. Since then, the Asari have served as the mediators and centrists of the Council. An all-female race, the Asari reproduce through a form of parthenogenesis. They can attune their nervous system to that of another individual of any gender and of any species to reproduce. This capability has led to the unseemly and inaccurate rumors about Asari promiscuity. Asari can live for over a thousand years, passing through three stages of life. In the maiden stage, they wander restlessly, seeking new knowledge and experience. When the matron stage begins, they meld with interesting partners to produce their offspring. This ends when they reach the matriarch stage, where they assume the roles of leaders and counselors. The second species to join the citadel, the Salarians are warm-blooded amphibians with a hyperactive metabolism. Salarians think fast, talk fast, and move fast. To Salarians, other species seem sluggish and dull-witted. Unfortunately, their metabolic speed leaves them with a relatively short lifespan. Salarians over the age of 40 are a rarity. The Salarians were responsible for advancing the development of the primitive Krogan species to use as soldiers during the Rachni Wars. They were also behind the creation of the Genophage bioweapon the Turians used to quell the Krogan Rebellion several centuries later. Salarians are known for their observational capability and non-linear thinking. This manifests as an aptitude for research and espionage. They are constantly experimenting and inventing, and it is generally accepted that they always know more than they are letting on. Roughly 1,200 years ago, the Turians were invited to join the Citadel Council to fulfill the role of galactic peacekeepers. The Turians have the largest fleet in Citadel space, and they make up the single largest portion of the Council's military forces. As their territory and influence has spread, 
The Torians have come to rely on the Salarians for military intelligence and the Asari for diplomacy. Despite a somewhat colonial attitude towards the rest of the galaxy, the ruling hierarchy understands they would lose more than they would gain if the other two races were ever removed. Turians come from an autocratic society that values discipline and possesses a strong sense of personal and collective honor. There is lingering animosity between Turians and humans over the first contact war of 2157, which is known as the Relay 314 incident to the Turians. Officially, however, the two species are allies and they enjoy civil, if cool, diplomatic relations. Fifty thousand years ago, the Protheans were the only spacefaring species in the galaxy. They vanished in a swift galactic extinction. Only the legacy of their empire remains. They are believed to have built the mass relays and the citadel, which have allowed numerous species to explore and expand throughout the galaxy. Prothean ruins are found on worlds across the galaxy. While surprisingly intact for their age, functioning examples of Prothean paleotechnology are rare. Time and generations of looters have picked their dead cities and derelict stations clean. Some believe the Protheans meddled in the evolution of younger races. The Hanar homeworld of Kaje, for example, shows clear evidence of former Prothean occupation. The presence of a former Prothean observation post on Mars has caused a rebirth of interventionary evolutionists among humans. These individuals believe the god myths of ancient civilizations are misremembered encounters with aliens. Though now extinct, the Rachni once threatened every species in Citadel space. Over 2,000 years ago, explorers foolishly opened a mass relay to a previously unknown system and encountered something never seen before or since a species of spacefaring insects guided by a hive mind intelligence. Unfortunately, the Rachni were not peaceful, and the galaxy was plunged into a series of conflicts known as the Rachni Wars. Attempts to negotiate were futile, as it was impossible to make contact with the hive queens that guided the race from beneath the surface of their toxic home world. The emergence of the Krogan ended the Rachni Wars. Bred to survive the harshest environments, the Krogan were able to strike at the queens in their lairs and reclaim conquered council worlds. But when Krogan fleets pressed them back to their homeworld, the Rachni refused to surrender, and the Krogan eradicated them from the galaxy. In the early 2160s, the Alliance began aggressive colonization of worlds in the Scillian Verge, much to the dismay of the Batarians, who had been developing the region for several decades. In 2171, the Batarians petitioned the Council to declare the Verge a zone of Batarian interest. The Council refused, however, declaring unsettled worlds in the region open to human colonization. In protest, the Batarians closed their Citadel Embassy and severed official diplomatic relations with the Council, effectively becoming a rogue state. They instigated a proxy war in the Verge by funneling money and weapons to criminal organizations, urging them to strike at human colonies. Hostilities peaked with the Skillian Blitz of 2176, an attack on the human capital of Elysium by Batarian-funded pirates and slavers. In 2178, the Alliance retaliated with a crushing assault on the moon of Torfin, long used as a staging base by Batarian-backed criminals. In the aftermath, the Batarians retreated into their own systems and are now rarely seen in Citadel space. The Geth are a humanoid race of networked AIs. They were created by the Quarians 300 years ago as tools of labor and war. When the Geth showed signs of self-evolution, the Quarians attempted to exterminate them. The Geth won the resulting war. This example has led to legal, systematic repression of artificial intelligences in galactic society. The Geth possess a unique distributed intelligence. An individual has rudimentary animal instincts, but as their numbers and proximity increase, 
the apparent intelligence of each individual improves. In groups, they can reason, analyze situations, and use tactics, as well as any organic race. Geth space is located at the trailing end of the Perseus arm, beyond the lawless Terminus systems. The Perseus Veil, an obscuring dark nebula of opaque gas and dust, lies between their space and the Terminus systems. When the Asari discovered the Citadel, they also discovered the Keepers, a docile, multi-limbed insect race that seemingly exists only to maintain and repair the Great Prothean Station. Early attempts to communicate with or study the Keepers were failures, and it is now illegal to interfere with or impede Keeper activity. Because they are completely non-threatening, Keepers have become virtually invisible to everyone else. Similarly, they seem indifferent to other species, except for their tendency to help new arrivals integrate themselves into the Citadel. No matter how many Keepers die due to old age, violence, or accident, they maintain a constant number. No one has discovered the source of new Keepers, but some hypothesize they are genetic constructs, biological androids created somewhere deep in the inaccessible core of the Citadel itself. The Krogan evolved in a hostile and vicious environment. Until the invention of gunpowder weapons, eaten by predators was still the number one cause of Krogan fatalities. Afterwards, it was death by gunshot. When the Solarians discovered them, the Krogan were a brutal, primitive species, struggling to survive a self-inflicted nuclear winter. The Solarians culturally uplifted them, teaching them to use and build modern technology so they could serve as soldiers in the Rachni War. Liberated from the harsh conditions of their homeworld, the quick-breeding Krogan experienced an unprecedented population explosion. They began to colonize nearby worlds, even though these worlds were already inhabited. The Krogan rebellions lasted nearly a century, only ending when the Turians unleashed the Genophage, a Solarian-developed bioweapon that crushed all Krogan resistance. The genophage makes only one in a thousand pregnancies viable, and today the Krogan are a slowly dying breed. Understandably, the Krogan harbor a grudge against all other species, especially the Turians. Driven from their home system by the Geth nearly three centuries ago, most Quarians now live aboard the migrant fleet a flotilla of 50,000 vessels ranging in size from passenger shuttles to mobile space stations. Home to 17 million Quarians, the flotilla understandably has scarce resources. Because of this, each Quarian must go on a rite of passage known as the pilgrimage when they come of age. They leave the fleet and only return once they have found something of value they can bring back to their people. Other species tend to look down on the Quarians for creating the Geth and for the negative impact their fleet has when it enters a system. This has led to many myths and rumors about the Quarians, including the belief that underneath their clothes and breathing masks, they are actually cybernetic creatures, a combination of organic and synthetic parts. The Volus are a member species of the Citadel with their own embassy, but they are also a client race of the Turians. Centuries ago, they were voluntarily absorbed into the hierarchy, effectively trading their mercantile prowess for Turian military protection. Erun, their homeworld, lies far beyond the normal life zone of its star. However, the world has a high-pressure greenhouse atmosphere that traps enough heat to support an ammonia-based biochemistry. As a result, the Volus must wear pressure suits and breathers when dealing with other species as conventional nitrogen-oxygen air mixtures are poisonous to them, and in the low-pressure atmospheres tolerable to most species, their flesh will actually split open. Volus culture is tribal, bartering lands and even people to gain status. This culture of exchange inclines them to economic pursuits. It was the Volus who authored the Unified Banking Act, and they continue to monitor and balance the Citadel economy. After the Geth secure a location, they round up and impale dead and living bodies on mechanical spikes. 
The spikes rapidly transform these victims into withered husks, extracting water and trace minerals, and replacing them with cybernetics. The cybernetics reanimate the lifeless flesh and tissue, transforming the bodies into mindless killing machines. Some Alliance soldiers refer to the husk-generating spikes as dragon's teeth, a reference to the mythological berserkers who sprang up from the earth wherever the teeth of the dragon Eris were planted. Dragon's teeth and husks bear little resemblance to other pieces of Geth technology. No one is sure why a synthetic race would bother to drain the minuscule amount of recoverable resources from organic corpses, though the value of reusing them as shock troops is obvious. The Citadel is an ancient deep space station presumably constructed by the Protheans. Since the Prothean extinction, numerous species have come to call the Citadel home. It serves as the political, cultural, and financial capital of the galactic community. To represent their interests, most species maintain embassies on the Presidium, the Citadel's inner ring. The Citadel Tower in the center of the Presidium holds the Citadel Council Chambers. Council affairs often have far-reaching effects on the rest of the galactic community. Five arms, known as the wards, extend from the Presidium. Their inner surfaces have been built into cities, populated by millions of inhabitants from across the galaxy. The Citadel is virtually indestructible. If attacked, the station can close its arms to form a solid, impregnable shell. For as long as the station has existed, an enigmatic race called the Keepers has maintained it. The Council is an executive committee composed of representatives from the Asari Republics, the Turian Hierarchy, and the Salarian Union. Though they have no official power over the independent governments of other species, the Council's decisions carry great weight throughout the galaxy. No single Council race is strong enough to defy the other two and all have a vested interest in compromise and cooperation. Each of the Council species has general characteristics associated with the various aspects of governing the galaxy. The Asari are typically seen as diplomats and mediators. The Salarians gather intelligence and information. The Turians provide the bulk of the military and peacekeeping forces. Any species granted an embassy on the Citadel is considered an associate member bound by the accords of the Citadel Conventions. Associate members may bring issues to the attention of the Council, though they have no input on the decision. The Human Systems Alliance became an associate member of the Citadel in 2165. Spectres are agents from the Office of Special Tactics and Reconnaissance and answer only to the Citadel Council. They are elite military operatives, granted the authority to deal with threats to peace and stability in whatever way they deem necessary. They operate independently or in groups of two or three. Some are empathetic peacekeepers, resolving disputes through diplomacy. Others are cold-blooded assassins, ruthlessly dispatching problem individuals. All get the job done one way or another, often operating outside the bounds of galactic law. The Spectres were founded after the Salarians joined the Council. For many years, they operated in secrecy as backroom problem solvers. Only after the Krogan rebellions did their activities become publicized. Assignment of a Spectre is less contentious than a military deployment, but makes it clear that the Council is concerned about a situation. Humanity's first contact with an alien race occurred in 2157. At that time, the Alliance allowed survey fleets to activate any dormant mass relays discovered, a practice considered dangerous and irresponsible by Council-aligned races. When a Turian patrol discovered a human fleet attempting to activate a relay, they attacked. One human vessel survived, retreating to the colony of Shanxi. The Turians followed, quickly defeating the local forces. Shanxi was occupied, the first and to date only human world to be conquered by an alien species. The Turians believed the handful of ships they defeated represented the bulk of human defenses, so they were unprepared when the second fleet, 
under Admiral Castany Drescher, launched a strong counteroffensive, evicting them from Shanxi. The Turians mobilized for full-scale war, drawing the attention of the rest of the galaxy. The Council quickly intervened, forcing a truce. Fortunately for humanity, the first contact war was ended with a diplomatic solution. The Systems Alliance is an independent supranational government representing the interests of humanity as a whole. The Alliance is responsible for the governance and defense of all extrasolar colonies and stations. The Alliance grew out of the various national space programs as a matter of practicality. Sol's planets had been explored and exploited through piecemeal national efforts. The expense of colonizing entire new solar systems could not be met by any one country. With humans knowing that alien contact was inevitable, there was enough political will to jointly fund an international effort. Still, the Alliance was often disregarded by those on Earth until the first contact war. While the national governments dithered and bickered over who should lead the effort to liberate Shanxi, the Alliance fleet struck decisively. Post-war public approval gave the Alliance the credibility to establish its own parliament and become the galactic face of humanity. The Terminus systems are located on the far side of the Attican Traverse, beyond the space administered by the Citadel Council or claimed by the Human Systems Alliance. It is populated by a loose affiliation of minor species, united only in their refusal to acknowledge the political authority of the Council or adhere to the Citadel Conventions. Their independence comes at a price. The Terminus is fraught with conflict. War among the various species is common, as governments and dictators constantly rise and fall. The region is a haven for illegal activities, particularly piracy and the slave trade. At least once a year, a fleet from the Terminus invades the nearby Attican Traverse. These attacks are typically small raids against poorly defended colonies. The Council rarely retaliates, as sending patrols into the Terminus systems could unify the disparate species against their common foe, triggering a long and costly war. There are between two and four hundred billion stars in the galaxy, and less than one percent of them have ever been visited or had their systems properly surveyed. Humanity's early expansion into the Attican Traverse was haphazard, a desperate race to claim habitable planets where populations can be economically settled. Ignored in the wake of this land grab were thousands of less hospitable worlds, each potentially rich with industrial resources. The wealth of entire solar systems lies untapped, waiting for corporate survey teams or independent pioneers to discover and exploit them. However, this is not an easy task. In addition to the environmental hazards, the fact that uncharted worlds are largely ignored makes them popular bases for criminals, revolutionaries, cults, and others who wish to remain unnoticed by galactic society. Biotics is the ability of rare individuals to manipulate dark energy and create mass effect fields through the use of electrical impulses from the brain. Intense training and surgically implanted amplifiers are necessary for a biotic to produce mass effect fields powerful enough for practical use. The relative strength of biotic abilities varies greatly among species and with each individual. There are three branches of biotics. Telekinesis uses mass lowering fields to levitate or impel objects. Mass raising kinetic fields are used to block or pin objects. Spatial distortion uses rapidly shifting mass fields to shred objects. Most organic species are capable of developing biotic abilities, though there are risks involved. Biotics are the result of an in utero exposure to element zero. This usually causes fatal cancers in the victim, but in rare cases, it coalesces into nodules within the fetus's developing nervous system. An artificial intelligence is a self-aware computing system capable of learning and independent decision-making. 
Creation of a conscious AI requires adaptive code, a slow, expensive education, and a specialized quantum computer called a blue box. An AI cannot be transmitted across a communication channel or computer network. Without its blue box, an AI is no more than data files. Loading these files into a new blue box will create a new personality, as variations in the quantum hardware and runtime results create unpredictable variations. The Geths serve as a cautionary tale against the dangers of rogue AI, and in Citadel space, they are technically illegal. Advocacy groups argue, however, that an AI is a living, conscious entity, deserving the same rights as organics. They argue that continued use of the term artificial is institutionalized racism on the part of organic life. The term synthetic is considered the politically correct alternative. A virtual intelligence is an advanced form of user interface software. VIs use a variety of methods to simulate natural conversation, including an audio interface and an avatar personality to interact with. Although a VI can provide a convincing emulation of sentience, they are not self-aware, nor can they learn or take independent action. VIs are used as operating systems on commercial and home computers. Minimal VI agents are also available. Agents are compact and specialized. Some serve as personal secretaries, filtering calls and scheduling meetings based on user-defined priorities. Others are advanced search engines, propagating themselves across the extranet to collate user-requested data. Commercial VIs in a variety of stock personalities are available at any software retailer. Boutique firms and hobbyists also build unique VIs to personal specification. Although software emulation of living personalities is illegal, reconstructions of famous historical figures are common. Mass relays are feats of Prothean engineering advanced far beyond the technology of any living species. They are enormous structures scattered throughout the stars and can create corridors of virtually mass-free space, allowing instantaneous transit between locations separated by years or even centuries of travel using conventional FTL drives. Primary mass relays can propel ships thousands of light years, often from one spiral arm of the galaxy to another. However, they have fixed one-to-one -one connections a primary relay connects to one other primary relay and nowhere else. Secondary relays can only propel ships across a few hundred light years. However, they are omnidirectional. A secondary relay can send a ship to any other relay within its limited range. There are many dormant primary relays whose corresponding twins have not yet been located. These are left inactive until their partner is charted. As established civilizations are unwilling to blindly open a passage that might connect them to a hostile species. Omnitools are handheld devices that combine a computer microframe, sensor analysis pack, and manufacturing fabricator. Versatile and reliable, an Omnitool can be used to analyze and adjust the functionality of most standard equipment, including weapons and armor, from a distance. The fabrication module can rapidly assemble small three-dimensional objects from common reusable industrial plastics, ceramics, and light alloys. This allows for field repairs and modifications to most standard items, as well as the reuse of salvaged equipment. Omnitools are standard issue for soldiers and first-in colonists. Combat hard suits use a dual layer system to protect the wearer. The inner layer consists of fabric armor with kinetic padding. Areas that don't need to be flexible, such as the chest or shins, are reinforced with sheets of lightweight ablative ceramic. The outer layer consists of automatically generated kinetic barriers. Objects traveling above a certain speed will trigger the barrier's reflex system and be deflected, provided there is enough energy left in the shield's power cell. Armored hard suits are sealable to protect the wearer from extremes of temperature and atmosphere. Standard equipment includes an onboard mini frame 
and a communications, navigation, and sensing suite. The mini frame is designed to accept and display data from a weapon's smart targeting system to make it easier to locate and eliminate enemies. Kinetic barriers, more commonly called shields, provide protection against most mass accelerator weapons. Whether on a starship or a soldier's suit of armor, the basic principle remains the same. Kinetic barriers are repulsive mass effect fields projected from tiny emitters. These shields safely deflect small objects traveling at rapid velocities. This affords protection from bullets and other dangerous projectiles, but still allows the user to sit down without knocking away their chair. The shielding afforded by kinetic barriers does not protect against extremes of temperature, toxins, or radiation. All modern infantry weapons, from pistols to assault rifles, use micro-scaled mass accelerator technology. Projectiles consist of tiny metal slugs suspended within a mass-reducing field, accelerated by magnetic force to speeds that inflict kinetic damage. The ammo magazine is a simple block of metal. The gun's internal computer calculates the mass needed to reach the target based on distance, gravity, and atmospheric pressure then shears off an appropriate sized slug from the block. A single block can supply thousands of rounds, making ammo a non-issue during any engagement. Top-line weapons also feature smart targeting that allows them to correct for weather and environment. Firing on a target in a howling gale feels the same as it does on a calm day at the practice range. Smart targeting does not mean a bullet will automatically find the mark every time the trigger is pulled. It only makes it easier for the marksman to aim.
The Normandy is a prototype starship developed by the Human Systems Alliance with the assistance of the Citadel Council. It is optimized for scouting and reconnaissance missions in unstable regions using state-of-the-art stealth technology. For most ships, the heat generated through standard operations is easily detectable against the absolute zero background of space. The Normandy, however, is able to temporarily sink this heat within the hull. Combined with refrigeration of the exterior hull, the ship can travel undetected for hours or drift passively for days of covert observation. This is not without risk. The stored heat must eventually be radiated or it will build to levels capable of cooking the crew alive. Another component of the stealth system is the Normandy's revolutionary Tantalus drive, a mass effect core twice the standard size. The Tantalus drive generates mass concentrations that the Normandy falls into, allowing it to move without the use of heat emitting thrusters.